All right. Okay. Hi, Wen-Tian. How are you? Hi. Um, thank you again, everyone, for uh, joining us today. So once again, today, uh, we have Wen-Tian from Anhui Agricultural University uh, with us. So she has a master's degree in tea studies, and she has since been a lecturer at the university. <laughs> and she teaches a lot of classes on Chinese tea history and culture in the school. Uh, very popular teacher, and we're so glad to have her today. Uh, Wen-Tian, would you like to uh, say something about yourself? Okay, uh, thank you, Shunan, and thank everyone. I'm very glad and be honored to be invited by Shunan and uh, sharing something I know about Chinese people drink, uh, drinking methods for tea. And uh, I hope my sharing about this knowledge will be helpful for you and your future tea drinking. Um, anyhow, uh, <laughs> thank you guys. So, All right. should I start? Yes, please start. Okay. Um, yeah. So today, obviously, is the second um, uh, part of our three-part series on how the Chinese drink tea. Um, so Wen Tian is going to first take us through uh, a little review of what we talked about last time uh, of the Tang and Song Dynasty, and then uh, the second part, which is today, we talk about Ming and Qing Dynasty. All right, Wen Tian. Okay. Ah, thank you, Yishun. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. So uh, for the last week, we talked about the first two chapter of the Chinese drinking, uh, tea drinking style in history, uh, focusing mainly on the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty, which is compare, uh, which is considered for Chinese historians as the um, early age of Chinese civilization or the mid early. Um, the, so today we're going to talk about the next two chapters about the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty and uh, during then how people was thinking about tea. But before we jump into our main chapters, let's take some uh, review about the uh, previous uh, knowledges about early age tea drinking um, for Ming Dynasty. So last, uh, last week we talked about the first tea we found in China, uh, which is 20 cent 21 centuries long, a long time ago. That's very, very, uh, date back to the early history of Han Dynasty. And this is the actual uh, scientific proof and pictures that I just, uh, uh, I, 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 um, I taped from, uh, paste from the uh, scientific uh, art, art, uh, articles. Uh, yeah, scientific articles about archeologist foundings in Hanyang Ling, a museum, which is not a museum, actually it's a tomb of the fourth emperor of Han Dynasty. And then this is the very long time ago, and this was published in uh, four years ago, and we can see in the picture here in the left foot, uh, uh, previous four uh, tea leaves was actually the residue from, uh, brick from uh, broken from this pile of tea. Those uh, who look, may look like uh, tea cakes, but actually it was being buried underground for 2,100 years long. So of course it's compressed a little bit, but actually it was just a pile of loose tea we can now see. And the fifth of uh, in the E, picture E, is actually a modern tea bud. We can see through 21 centuries of history and time, basically the tea plant was the same as we saw now, then and now. And of course, the tea buds is for now, for, for present, is of course, is bigger and stronger. But the, the basic shape and, uh, um, and, and, and the plant uh, figures is actually the same. So they also have the bud and the shield. Uh, so it's pretty much obvious as tea and also been proved by other scientific methods. Right. And I want to... Um, uh... Uh, also add on that this is a process tea, right? This is not the different, um, there are other archeology span evidence to, to prove uh, earlier history of cultivation of tea. So basically when we dig out uh, actual tea uh, roots or branches, um, maybe petrified branches and things like that. So this is the hard evidence of uh, yes. we actually took the tea and processed them. So basically it's almost like the difference of uh, uh, evidence that people have planted grapes versus <coughs> having Sorry. wine. So there's, that's why uh, it sounds so recent, which is a 790 degree, uh, sorry, 790 uh, AD. 
Uh, so, so that I just want to make sure we we're clarified on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, after sorry, after the manufacture or the uh, the evidence we found in the ancient tombs, uh, we also have other. Um, I don't really think this is uh, the real artifacts or relics that directly we found in some tombs. Is this is uh, actually the replica of the modern people. So this, uh, for the left part, this is the uh, steamed green tea cake, compressed into tea cakes. And this is the product um, people um, recreate based on the description uh, in the ancient tea books from Tang Dynasty. So it was quite similar to the old Chinese money that was a hole inside and the people <laughs> use it to, 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 uh, to make it like a skew, a skew, yeah, a skew and uh, roast it inside of the roast oven. And, but this is in Tang Dynasty, everyone would just be satisfied with uh, this kind of tea cakes. But in Song Dynasty, the uh, manufacturers, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the farmers uh, actually have bigger resource, a bigger request for the shape of tea cakes. And they, are, um, they, they have the very delicate model um, ordered from the emperor himself directly, uh, Zhao Song. Song Tai, Song, uh, Song Tai Zong, yeah, uh, second emperor of Song Dynasty, and he gave the orders to the uh, to, to the craftsmen and to make the very beautiful and delicate tea models uh, only for the for the royal family and for other people. They may get the presents from the royal family with tea cakes, but shaped in different things. But most of the known ones are the dragon and the phoenix models, in what we call in Chinese is Long Feng Tuan Cha, the dragon and phoenix patterned tea cake. So yeah. these two are the first two um, mainstream tea products we know from, from, from Tang and the Song Dynasty. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and the dragon and, and the phoenix patterns yeah. are only reserved for the uh, emperor. The royal courts. The, the empress, yeah. For the <clears throat> yeah. And uh, for the three um, uh, drinking tea, tea drinking methods we mentioned uh, in the last week is the boiling uh, or in Chinese zhu cha fa and jian cha style and dian cha style. For those three, actually, um, there have a very uh, obvious line for involving from just cooking with other ingredients for um, uh, like with gingers, orange peels, and salt, even sugar probably. Um, but this is basically for the nutrition uh, supplement or just to have this very exotic uh, tea plant by then it was considered as a symbol of one person's social status. And in Jian Cha style, um, the scholars, uh, the, the literature scholars, such as Lu Yu, the author of Tea Classic in Midtown Dynasty, who give out the, who, who, who give other solutions about drinking tea with only salt to flavor and, and also set a basic tone for tea, uh, enjoy, for tea enjoying or entertainment in Chinese cultural uh, world, like the, uh, tea is a uh, as a kind of symbol for the elegant and simplified lifestyle, that which is quite different from those uh, the, um, the the aristocracy and noble families lead their lifestyle with luxuries. So this is kind of like evolving from uh, with a lot of ingredients to one ingredients. It's a kind of concession, and then it consists to the further further to the Dian Cha style. But however, Dian Cha style, um, the methods is actually a little bit easier than Dian Cha style. Um, the tea utensils the involved is less, but, how, but the skill was required more because we, uh, uh, if you still remember, we saw the video clip that showing the people, uh, the, the, uh, the tea maker, um, yeah, the, the owner of the tea have to whisk the tea um, tea liqueur very hardly and repeatedly adding the water from one bit to one bit and to, f to form a cup of li liqueur full of foam, very beautiful white foam. And this is the main, uh, how to say, the Dian Cha, uh, Dian Cha for, I mean for. And also the two, they have totally, totally different uh, tea utensils that has been um, innovated or um, Developed, uh, derived from Chinese uh, other drinking methods for like uh, for wine, for for uh, for tea, for soups, for porridges. Uh, so in Tang Dynasty, the first time that Chinese people had had uh, designed and designed for the tea utensils, firstly, uh, totally different from other utensils. And the, from uh, in the left part, we saw the picture of the Tang 
Tang uh, Tang relics from the Fa Men Si that we talk about the temple that who uh, serving the She Li Zi crystal, <laughs> <laughs> the Buddhism yeah. crystal. I don't know how to translate this. And uh, this is, uh, so, so, uh, the set of tea utensils were belong used to belong to the emperor of Tang, uh, the Tang Xizong himself, and even his name was carved on top of uh, some like the, the tea tea canisters and other uh, you know, tea sifters covered with his name on it. So it's actual actual evidence for how the noble family drinking tea with uh, utensils that is in, in uh, the pure, uh, yes, silver um, and gold, very luxury. But in the scholar world, intellectual uh, class, they have this favor, uh, uh, they have this preference to use the porcelain uh, you can porcelain tea balls or uh, on the wood and bamboo made uh, other tea uh, accessory utensils like in to including sifters and uh, canisters or uh, the, the salt plates. And for the Song Dynasty, for Dian Cha Fa, the utensils are actually kind of like a less, a lot less. Like only probably half of them according to different two uh, tea books. But still the the, the tea powder was actually being asked for um, more fine grind, more fine fine grind. Uh, in, for tea, for Tang, uh, for, for Jian Cha style, people only require the tea to be like uh, broken into the pieces as like uh, with the size of couscous. But in the tea uh, Dian Cha style, um, the tea drinkers will require the tea to be um, ground and milled uh, into very very tiny tea dust. So when drinking, uh, when, when um, infusing with the hot water and whisking with the tea whisk, it can uh, floating inside the tea, um, yeah, the tea liqueur and drinking with a whole full body and consistency. So this actually is kind of like um, improvement for tea making and tea uh, serving style and drinking style. Yeah. Great. And uh, now this, let's get, uh, get on to what happened to Ming Dynasty, which is considered as the uh, second, high, uh, second peak for Chinese ancient tea, cultural, uh, tea, tea culture um, development. And Ming Dynasty, uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, also hear, uh, make sure that we, we don't misunderstand that um, Ming Dynasty is not immediately after uh, Song Dynasty. Yeah, there no. are other uh, time periods have passed as well. But remember, we're talking about a, uh, the history of tea uh, and also especially how Chinese drink tea. So we specifically yeah. want to talk about uh, the evolvement of uh, sorry, the evolution of a different drinking style. Uh, so that's why we're skipping the other insignificant period. Um, so I just yeah. like yeah. we have this fast forward <laughs> and skip the whole Yuan Dynasty, which is probably a hundred thirty year long time period. Um, yeah, for that, for about that year. And uh, during that period between Song and the Ming Dynasty, I, I don't really think the rulers um, by then, like the conquerors of Mongolia, they don't really care about how Chinese people or how the, the southern people, they call Nan uh, southern people, the, how they're drinking their own habits for tea drinking. But of course, there are some scholars in Yuan Dynasty actually have their own preference about tea and because this um, the trade uh, uh, related to uh, the trade between Mongolian country to the Song, uh, so south and southern Song and north Song uh, time, they, uh, the government, the regime, they all they, they already have this kind of uh, trade and, and exchange between tea and horses a uh, very long time ago, like uh, date back to the 10th and 9th uh, 10th century and 11th century beginning. Um, but they don't really um, change the tea drinking habits based on their own tea drinking methods. Um, I think the, probably the Mongolian people more <laughs> into the, the Asian Mongolian people are more into the milk wine or milk uh, alcohol instead of the tea. So yeah. the yeah. tea drinking method was not, they basically not changed. But in Ming Dynasty, they has a very big change and very important change that influenced everyone who drinks tea now on the planet, which is um, the, Abolish the tea pressing. Uh, yeah, uh, the emperor who the first emperor of Ming Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhao, uh, whose picture is usually not looked like this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a very interesting story. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, because uh, the emperor um, 
uh, in Chinese history, they have this cultural, how to say, I don't know, thoughts that the emperor himself must look different from other people. Sometimes uh, actual handsome, some, sometimes actual ugly, ugliness or weirdness, I think. So in his uh, description for the other um, painters, uh, the, this, the, this first emperor who is, uh, who was actually a, a monk, who used to be a monk and who used to be a, a beggar, yeah, a real beggar. And he, he wants to be thought as somewhat extraordinary. So he was, he was telling all the other paints that he looks very ugly and with a face that's very, very, uh, how to say, that, that's more than ugly. I don't, I don't know how to say that. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, oftentimes when you see the picture of the first emperor in China, you see this picture of a very long and narrow face, and it, it kind of curves as well. Yeah. We say that, um, uh, what is that thing that people use to basically pull up your, your, your shoes when it's too tight? Um, I don't use that, so I don't know what it's called. <laughs> but basically, uh, that's what we call his name looks like. And it's so... Um, uh, I guess it's so deeply influential uh, to the point that usually if you see a uh, TV show or something that people is trying to depict his, her, uh, yeah, his face in that kind of uh, uh, shape. Yeah, but this picture uh, that I took for, uh, to, sh to show his face is actually a royal um, painting, uh, yeah, painting, painting collection for the ancestors of this Ming dynasty only served or um, being, um, being had on the, uh, the royal family temple. So this is, a, uh, according to other historians, this is the actual uh, look of his face. Um, he's quite a handsome man in his younger age, I think, and uh, he gave the uh, order to abolish uh, the tea cake pressing, uh, processing in the twenty um, fourth of his own regime, uh, which is the uh, around uh, yeah hundred one uh, 13, 1391, 1391 AD, and by that year he, according to his own uh, records, um, he gave out the order that no tea cakes will be produced after. His order in Nationwide, and only Lucy will be demanded by the royal court. Uh, with his encouragement, and the whole country start to um, changing their methods, uh, ch changing the appearance of the tea product, which uh, from the tea cake to the loose tea. And this changing is very, is very helpful for uh, the whole tea industrial in tea and uh, in Ming Dynasty because the, just compared to the loose tea, tea cakes is very time consuming. Um, take uh, for the Song Song Dynasty's royal batch for the tea cakes as example, it takes um, more than one month to make one batch from the green leaves to tea cakes. And uh, uh, by uh, during that period, the tea product will be um, steamed and uh, roast and, and uh, steamed and rolled and squeezed and washed and then um, roast for the first time and re-wash and uh, re-squeeze and re-wash and re-roast for repeatedly for three times and then finally shipped into the tea cakes with patterns uh, with certain patterns including phoenix or dragons or other um, are the flower or a cloud shift or somehow and also normally especially for the expensive tea cakes um the uh, the, the farmers or the men uh, or the uh, workers will add in some other incense including the um sometimes or yeah including orange or other like the long xian xiang i don't know how to say this do you know that yeah it's a yeah, it's, a, it's a it's a kind of uh, incense i think it's uh mm -hmm. it's actually a uh, it's it's actually a a, a, a crystallized the vomit thing. of whale <laughs> inside of uh, like a whale. Uh, it's quite yeah. disgusting how it's produced, but it's considered one of the uh, very sophisticated. It's similar to mask, actually, quite similar to mask, but it's different. It's a a, pro a bio, bio product from the whale. Uh, anyhow, anyhow, with this kind of processing, the tea cakes in Song Dynasty mostly with a very delicate appearance, but still is time consuming and also quite lack of the flavor and aroma of tea directly uh, with, um, replaced with other um, flavor and aroma. And uh, after changing this tea whole process uh, to loose tea, which is actually um, 
but she's actually adopted while or uh, widely before Song Dynasty and Tang Dynasty. And Chinese people now, firstly, have this feel feeling ag again for the uh, oral uh, for the um, actual flavor of tea uh, with grassy a little bit and also the very refreshing tea flavor. And to, by this uh, changing, it's not just because of the um, the, the political orders, but also there's a, a kind of improvement for the uh, uh, manufacturing um, skills in the eight, sorry in in the mid Song then in late Song dynasty the iron pen a uh, brown bottom pen was um, uh, widely adopted by the uh, cooking uh, cuisine uh, cuisine culinary work and other manufacturing work uh, relate to the um, agricultural uh, product including tea so people uh, the adopt from the steamed fixation, which is, uh, by the way, kill grain, uh, or um, actually to say it's the enzyme, uh, a step from the steaming to the pan fried. And this change doesn't, doesn't not just, uh, how to say, um, uh, fast forward all the uh, processing flow. And also it gave out, uh, they gave the tea product another kind of flavor, uh, which is quite similar to the fried beans. Uh, they were very, very um, appealing and also maintaining the color of tea itself uh, in, uh, and developed the tea, ar tea aroma from the grassy of, uh, was uh, based by the steaming and to the, um, how to say this, um, uh, and fl floral aroma. That's very, very uh, attractive, very attractive for the people to drink and also easier to cut product. Um, for my experience, I, I used to make my, my make tea my, by myself, which is very, very hard. I think, Shuna, you also can relate to the experience. That making tea with uh, pan fried fixation and with other uh, roasting, uh, roasting um, yeah, the loose tea product, producting, uh, processing flow, it can be very shortly. Uh, my fir my uh, first hand experience is from the green leaves to the tea drinkable product will take less than 10 hours for a batch. So that is very much uh, improved the whole uh, efficiency for tea processing. And that is also why, a reason why that after late Ming Dynasty, there are lots of other tea products, uh, uh, including the Hei Cha, the dark tea, and the Huang Cha, the yellow tea, has been also found in Chinese uh, territory. Can we um, uh, spend a minute to talk about what was the motivation for uh, the first emperor of Ming Dynasty to want to abolish uh, the tea cake processing? Because this is a very, this is probably in terms of an official decree, this is probably the uh, single most important event in tea history. Um, so, because, uh, you know, he, he actually is an emperor who he decided to put this into, uh, you know, an official order to do that. So what was his uh, uh, motivation to do that? Uh, according to his order that being recorded in Ming Tai Zu Shi Lu, the, uh, the, the, the course from the, the documents from himself, is that he was thinking this whole processing of tea cakes is way too um, expensive in time and also for labor cost and the tea product harvesting. According to the, uh, the last two, uh, second last emperor of South, uh, North Song era, uh, Song Huizong, and his work, Da Guan Cha Lun, we talked about last week. And according to that book, tea should be harvested uh, with certain, by, by the maids, I mean the young virgin, <laughs> which is very badly. And also, and the worker should, that should take um, the, uh, a basket with water inside and to, to uh, get, get rid, uh, to make the, uh, to prevent the tea fresh leaves from, get, uh, from being polluted by, polluted by the water's steam or somehow. And then also they have to dry the tea leaves and make the tea leaves, uh, and make tea cakes, uh, especially for the royal court family, which is very expensive and time consuming and also totally unnecessary. So for the emperor himself, who uh, came from a lower place in, in the world, he's, he was an orphan. He, was, he used to join the Buddhism monk only for food. And he used to be a, a beggar or, or just a, a little wanderer guy, so a homeless guy. So he had this kind of a compassion for the uh, lower part of people, for the 
for no oh, sorry my i think my alarm <laughs> i need to just alarm it yeah so um i want to also mention so so when tian was talking about how uh this first emperor of Ming Dynasty, that he came from a very humble beginning, is also kind of significant in Chinese history as well, because he is actually the first and the only founding emperor of a major dynasty that actually came from nowhere. Um, there yeah. might be other emperors who, uh, in fact, the beginning was also kind of humble, but usually they have um, entitled, have some kind of association with past um important families and this gives them legitimacy so this is kind of like the first emperor that really came out of nowhere and the uh it's also very common back in the days for uh the emperors uh whenever a new emperor came to throne to kind of show uh that I am a benevolent emperor, right? Because yeah. um, remember, yeah. yeah, you basically have uh, one group of scholar that follows the emperor everywhere to record everything the emperor says and does, and then to uh, make it available for the future generation to criticize the things the emperors do. And you have another group of scholars who that their whole job is to consistently criticize the emperor while the emperor is still in ruling to tell you what you have done wrong and this is what you need uh, to do. Yeah. Like that. So, so it's very important for <laughs> to, to find things basically to show that I am a good emperor. Um, and so <laughs> in his own writing, he talks about how, uh, you know, he thinks it's basically too much a burden for the people to uh, to make tea the old style. Um, I'm not sure if he actually knows this is how it's done. Maybe he does because, you know, he did um, kind of come from a, uh, you know, from the people kind of. Um, uh, but even if he didn't know, but if maybe uh, somebody would have suggested him says, hey, um, did you know that the tea that you're drinking uh, actually is a uh, very heavy burden on your people. Maybe you should consider abolishing that. Um, so maybe he's like, okay, I'll do that. So, so that these are, uh, yeah, the, the exact reason we're distilled into very simple words is basically just to uh, lift the burden off the people. Um, so, the, but the, the actual, uh, you know, the, what has led to that step might be very complicated. Or it could just also be as simple as somebody suggested, and he's like, "Okay." Yeah. I, I will. I will link to the second uh, explanation with some of his um, some of his um, friends or uh, officers who work for him who give him a, how the suggestion. But as uh, there are also another theory about this, which is basically based from the economic thinking that for drinking, for making tea is very um, how to say it used to be a very um, beneficial or the profitable industry in China, especially in the farmer, in, in the agricultural society, which is um, tea is definitely a luxury food, a, a luxury um, drink, and not totally not necessary for people surviving. Some, some other um, his historian um, relics or some other documents will record records will say that well some people need the tea for daily drink and if they don't drink tea they will survive within or they will only survive for a week or a month which but actually is not true because for those people they didn't have drink tea drink for generations generations so you can see uh, the regulation of tea industry in china's history history actually start from tang dynasty and the, and the government and all, every regime that have tea industry in their own territory they will tax tax on it very heavily very heavily quite, quite close to the uh, tobacco industry for nowadays for the, the countries including china and um, for the tea to for, for uh, after the Foundation uh, after after the foundation of Song Dynasty, uh, which is 300 years before the Ming Dynasty, and they already started to uh, the, the 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 government already started to regulate uh, make the tea industry totally um, monopoly or yeah yeah, yeah mono yeah uh, state state owned tea industry since Song Dynasty and in Ming Dynasty and the early age of Qing Dynasty they also ha still have this policy. So for Ming, for, uh, for Zhu Yuanzhang, uh, the first emperor of Ming Dynasty, to give out order to stop the, uh, to abolish to abort, uh, abolish the tea cake processing is not just a compassion out of his, his compassion compassion of the very benevolent kind uh, king, but still also a kind of like the very um, 
a very, a very uh, how to say, a, a good business for him as well. With the higher uh, efficiency for tea manufacturing, of course, there will be more profit for the government to, to take. Because by Ming Dynasty, a whole Ming, in, during the whole Ming Dynasty, the tea manufacturing uh, and tea um, and also the tea, uh, tea business is basically state owned. So for himself's uh, sake, is also a very good, uh, is, is a great, a, a great deal according uh, from the economic view of saying. But how, no matter how, what kind of the reason that gave him the uh, for, uh, drive to do this, but his order actually helped out to the tea in industry because uh, processing the loose tea is actually a lot, a lot easier and faster. And of course, it will give more opportunity for people to make better product and innovate it from the old, uh, old tea cakes uh, compressed. Yeah. Can we say that it's because that we have narrowed down almost like the scope of tea making mm -hmm. that then the tea makers, uh, one has got an opportunity to uh, basically work with more focus. So uh, the tea making itself is being improved. And also it gives us a, another, uh, a different opportunity to actually appreciate what we call the true taste of tea. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, yeah, so, so it directs people's interest onto that. And so there are more um, developments on this very topic is to continuously to refine and to discover what is the true taste of the tea. And thirdly, mm -hmm. is that since it's no longer have heart requirement of how the tea has to be made, um, it's almost like you, you both uh, narrow down the scope and it also you open up the, uh, uh, the room for people's creativity to, to fly, uh, fly freely. So then you start to have all the different kinds of teas to start come about during this period of time as well. Yes, of course. And uh, so back into the tea drinking <laughs> styles, uh, we drifted from a very uh, short time ago. Short time ago, and this in Ming Dynasty, actually, um, people will believe. Oh, in Chi most Chinese people will believe that in Ming Dynasty, people started drinking tea with a pao cha style, but uh, not, uh, uh, ignore the fact that in Ming Dynasty, of course, there are still zhu cha style boiling the tea uh, with other uh, ingredients, but mostly adopted by people in some certain area, including the uh, Jiangsu province, a part of Jiangsu province, south east of China and the border areas, uh, but mostly uh, zhu cha uh, or the, the, the liqueur or the porridge that was, uh, was added with tea for uh, by zhu cha style or boiling style, uh, it was only, it was mostly for the nutrition supplement. That was for drinking, that, that was for eating, that was for uh, health, uh, for ha ha health. And the uh, second one is the dian cha style, which is still exists I can be, still be recorded and promoted by tea, uh, tea experts in early Ming Dynasty, including a very famous tea um, artist, uh, Zhu Quan, who is a 17th son of the first emperor uh, we just saw, Zhu Yuanzhang. He is a he is a royal family member. He's a he, he's a duke, and then his and his uh, his kingdom was in the Jiangxi province, the central part of China, which is where there is called Ming. So that he's his uh, name was also known as Ning Wang, the first generation of Ning Wang, the king of Ning kingdom. <coughs> and also himself <coughs> as a cultural figure, a cultural historian, a historical feature, himself Zhu Quan is a, 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 believe, a, a believer of Taoism. He's a Taoism believer. And also he may not have the chance to, uh, to conduct his own political uh, ambitions, but he um, how to say, direct, uh, directed from the politi political act, uh, movement to the tea drinking and other uh, art uh, uh, artistic activities, including tea drinking and also writing books for tea and writing books for tourism, uh, according to his own uh, thinking. So he give a, he, he, uh, so he give a lot of uh, compliments to Dian Cha Fa and help, he also encouraged people to try the Dian Cha Fa. But with the changing of the tea product, the drinking methods, the drinking styles have definitely been changed very swiftly. So after his death in the mid of the, the 15th century, the whole Chinese people started to adopt the Pao Cha style. 
just right after his death, probably, because of course Pao Cha style didn't come from nowhere. It came from the um, the, the very um, date back history from the Tang, a uh, mid Tang Dynasty, which then Pao Cha is used to be called Yan Cha, or like uh, drowning the tea in the water, <laughs> just Yan Yan, just float uh, uh, yeah, drowning over the tea. Being within the cup. First version of the of the uh, matcha almost yeah. yeah quite similar quite similar and how and interesting where well, well and also very um interesting that dian cha fa then being adopted by the japanese people in the early uh, compared to the early uh, yeah similar same time uh, as early ming dynasty uh, uh adopted by the tea experts in japan uh, such as uh, zeno likyo and other uh, other tea things, uh, other tea experts in in Japan before him. So uh, uh, back, uh, go back to the China Chinese view uh, for Chinese people's view that Dian uh, Dian Cha Fa then disappeared in history of uh, in late Ming Dynasty because by then no one really appreciates to drinking tea uh, to to grind tea into very fine fine power powder and drinking with uh, whisking and other very complex, complicated uh, tea drinking method, uh, such as Dian Cha Fa, and then, then adopt all the very easily to be conducted the, the Pao Cha style, uh, dipping the tea inside water, in, in the, uh, which is, uh, can be still, uh, and also Pao Cha Fa can found the evidence, not just in date back to the Tang Dynasty's records, documents, and also the ancient painting uh, like in Song Dynasty, South Song Dynasty, uh, the painting is called Ming Yuan Du Shi Tu, the uh, the uh, gambling, uh, the gambling game view in the tea garden, in, in uh, yeah, in tea garden, Ming Yuan Du Shi Tu, uh, which the painter was Liu Songnian, in a very famous, a very famous uh, art artist in South Song area who works for the royal family directly, and his other pieces was more renowned as the. Yan Cha Tu and the, recording the whole drinking tea with Dian Cha style in for the scholars and the royal family. But in his other, and in this piece of his work, uh, Ming Yuan Du Shi Tu, which is now, I think it's, uh, it's been collected and stored in the Taipei uh, Google Museum. Uh, yeah, yes, in Taipei. And in this, in this picture, we can now see here this in the set in the left center, uh, there's a figure, a man who with a with a cap with a hat on his head and holding a tea uh, kettle, uh, holding a tea kettle and pouring the water directly into the uh, in, into the tea cup, which is totally different from the Dian Cha Fa. The tea cup will be heated in, uh, before uh, the, the using and also with a whisk. This is very easily and uh, very easily conducted and very obviously a normal people's life. So uh, there are uh, some experts of well, tea history will just uh, take this as evidence for the early uh, Pao Cha style and the, the very first uh, glimpse of the Pao Cha style in Chinese history. The first official recording for the tea, um, uh, for Pao Cha style drinking tea is uh, appeared in the book in the mid, uh, mid of 16th century, which is basically the, uh, yeah, made, uh, made of Ming, a uh, late made Ming dynasty, and it's called Zhu Quan Xiaopin. But before him, before this book, uh, there are also other evidence and records, but not very specifically. Uh, focused on the tea drinking methods with Pao Cha style, but still there are some uh, similar writings and, the, and and the reports. And in this, uh, yeah, and also in, in Ming Dynasty, uh, basically we have saw the changing from the steamed tea, green tea cake, and to steam loose green tea, and then the pan uh, pan fried. Or pan fried or pan fried, uh, that's guo chao, <laughs> basically the same Yeah, thing. I know, it should be wok fried, but pan fried seems to be uh, the commonly used term in English right now. Uh, but yeah, it really should be wok fried, right? <laughs> <laughs> a wok is actually a translation, direct translation from the Cantonese of guo. It's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. wok. Yeah. So, yeah, pan fried and wok, wok fried is, is basically the same. And the, the green tea, of course, made it from this, uh, as Shunan mentioned, it gave out to the people more uh, creativity to, uh, to promote and, and to make more new tea products to make people, to, to appealing to other people for drinking tea. And in their, uh, in, in the workers, uh, 
uh, yeah, countless trials. There are three new tea leaves, actually, uh, three new tea products actually being promoted and uh, being produced uh, in the Ming Dynasty. For example, as Hei Cha, uh, which uh, and also known as the Chinese dog tea, uh, is being produced ab about the uh, early age, uh, uh, yeah, the early time of the 16th century. And um, this Hei Cha was basically the same as we know for now. Uh, the picture actually I showed is the uh, Shu Pu Er, the, the <laughs> right hand <laughs> one. I know, yeah. So, but it's actually, yeah. So, so, and then we know that Shu Pu is um, a relatively recent uh, uh, invention, right? It's uh, it didn't start until the 70s. And also, Hei Cha, a direct translation of that into English would be black tea. And obviously this caused a lot of confusion. Uh, I assume a lot of you know this already, uh, but just in case you didn't know about this, what Chinese call um, black tea is not what the West call black tea. What the West, in the West people call black tea is what we call uh, red tea, which you're gonna see in the future slides soon. Um, yeah, yeah so, so do not, get confused. Um, in order to accommodate the uh, common English terminology uh, that already existed for black tea, uh, we have changed that to dark tea, um, which you might also question what's the difference between the dark tea and the black tea. Um, yeah, so that that's the uh, the story. So Hei Cha equals Chinese black tea equals uh, dark tea. And, and the reason why I use the Shu Puer picture, for example, for Hei Cha, because by, uh, and from Ming, da, Ming, Ming Dynasty to nowadays, most of Chinese dark tea, the Hei Cha, is actually the tea bricks, made into bricks, uh, uh, into the squall shaped uh, big, uh, big pillars or something, pillar shaped or other uh, tea, uh, cake shaped. And those tea are actually mostly being uh, sold to the uh, border area people. Uh, including the Tibetan area, uh, the Xinjiang, Pro Xinjiang province, but now and also a, a Mongolian area, Mongolian kingdom area, which is now including by the, uh, it was referred to the Inner Mongolia province now. And for those tea leaves, for those tea products, the reason, the only reason people kept this being compressed into different shapes and bricks and cakes and, uh, and pillar shaped or somehow, it, it was because it's easier to pile up on the horseback. So that is the reason why the Hei Cha, until nowadays, until today, is still um, maintain this shape of compressed um, different shapes. And right. uh, I remember from yeah. the press key that uh, was demanded by the royal court before uh, we have switched to loose tea, right? It's different, different, different um, motivations and incentives behind why it was pressed. Yes, and then uh, later after the after the accidental uh, accidental uh, ac yeah accident, uh, accidental uh, innovation of Hei Cha, Chinese people then found out the, how of making the yellow tea, which is basically uh, uh, cover the lid for uh, or or just pack it up after the kilogram uh, step directly uh, with the heat and the steams will make the tea leaves to go yellowish uh, very very quickly actually, but the point, the accurate point of changing is very hard to, um, to, to, to get, very hard to get. So there are lots of mistakes and even, even leading to uh, uh, had a disappearance, a disappear for the, uh, some kind of the black, yellow tea, in, including Anhui provinces, uh, the Huashan Huangya has been, the, the manufacturing uh, skills have already been um, disappeared for, for a century, uh, re only recently uh, recreated, but still yellow tea is a very, um, very tasty tea product compared to the uh, green, uh, normal uh, pan-fried green tea is more mellow and uh, mild taste and also still, it just tastes very um, gentle. Yeah, a little rounder, a little smoother. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, besides those two tea, new tea product, uh, the scented tea are officially started to manufacture in Ming Dynasty, in the Ming, uh, made Ming Dynasty. And uh, this tea is, and the, there are books uh, recording the Chinese people use uh, flowers, including lotus flowers, which is very um, art, elegant, a symbol of elegant and, and uh, Purity, yeah, yeah purity in Chinese uh, cultural, uh, in Chinese culture, and also the uh, jasmine. Uh, yeah, I'll start it with also with jasmine flowers. Uh, with uh, I don't know how to say in, this, in English because that plant may not be seen 
people or in countries outside China is called called Dai Dai Hua. Uh, and also Yu uh, Zi Hua, fruit, uh, orange fruit or grapefruit flower uh, blossom. They used any, anything, any flower that actually has a great, a, a decent scent or, or, or aroma can be, a, can be adopted for the scented tea processing. And the scented tea, uh, for some of you guys may notice that I use different color uh, design for this because scented tea is now uh, is excluded from the six categories of tea for, for, in, for modern tea science. Because those tea actually was uh, what we call reprocessed tea. They're using the tea leaves with already certain, uh, with a certain um, chemical features, including like using the green tea. Uh, the roasted green tea, um, um, yeah, roasted dried green tea, Honggan, Hongqing Lu Cha, or the uh, roasted dried black tea, uh, Hongqing or uh, Honggan, uh, Hong Kao Hong Cha, Honggan Hong Cha, can be used. But the chemical, see, uh, the, the chemical changing already stopped only with the absorbing, the, the yeah, the absorbing of the scent of the flower. And this reprocessing does not change the chemical structure of tea product and the liqueur in, uh, um, they made but only with a very special scent um, absorbed from the flower. So this tea, uh, scented tea category was actually now excluded from the traditional or modern, um, yeah, modern and traditional <laughs> tea types. Yes. With so this is called a, yeah, so it's different from the six category of teas, which is green tea, yellow tea, white tea, oolong, red, and black. And the yeah. red is the Western black and the black is the Western dark, yeah. Um, so yeah, so scented tea is considered um, what we call uh, uh, reprocessed tea, right? So it's already done and then you add other things to it. I will say the difference will be um, like wine and sangria. So sangria is a wine-based beverage, but it's not just wine. Um, and in the modern days, it's also kind of like, you know, just like you would never use a really, really awesome bottle of wine and make it sangria, we also do not use really, really good tea to make it scented tea. Um, yes. So the scented tea, the quality factor actually has a lot to do with how well the tea is scented, not so much on how good the tea is. Um, but should we talk about how uh, the move, moving um, of capital city from uh, the mid uh, center part of China where tea uh, is produced to uh, Beijing. So basically moving from Nanjing, which literally means the southern capital, to Beijing, which is uh, the northern capital, uh, that also now they, you know, the, it's the capital city of China as well. So how this uh, uh, moving of capital city from the south to the north, which doesn't produce tea, might have facilitated the uh, uh, the debut of a scented tea? Oh, well, I think um, that this is more um, related to the, the, the water condition, probably, or just the, I think it's related to the water as, condition. as well. Yeah. The, days. the north part of China, usually, um, I mean, usually um, they found the, the natural water resources with uh, mineralized and uh, it's not very uh, friendly to tea making, to taste its own uh, flavor. I have this experience drinking tea even in the north part of Anhui province, which is only 500 kilometers from where I locate, where I'm based now in Hefei. The water is very mineralized, min min mineralized is very, very, bad for the tea. The black tea, which is Hong Cha, uh, <laughs> Chinese red tea. <laughs> okay, uh, for the, the tea, uh, tea liqueur, liqueur was actually turned black, completely black brown color uh, for compared to the southern part, the southern area of China who has a better water resources with less mineral will give, uh, will, will, uh, will show the original tea uh, tea liqueur with the same color as, as they expected. So I think the changing uh, or the preference for the northern parts of Chinese people who like to drink the scented tea, including jasmine tea or other uh, floral scented tea, is connected to, to their own uh, water and other uh, uh, geographic uh, features for their own living uh, area, I think. That's, that's probably one of the reasons. 
And maybe another reason is because the reprocessed tea is easier to trans transport with less uh, tea, water, con water, con uh, yeah, uh, water concentration, probably something. This, this is still probably, <laughs> this is still a very good, very interesting part to, to learn about or to getting a, a real uh, hardcore science, uh, hard, hardcore scientific research for it. I'll, I'll roll it down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, for the utensils and other important uh, important part of tea drinking in Chinese history, in Ming Dynasty, it is uh, basically the same. <coughs> Sorry, they have basically uh, quite similar artistic, uh, if that, um, yeah, uh, yeah, features for that we now have today. For in Jing Dezhen, like they uh, were the center of the porcelain manufacturing Chinese now uh, from back to back to Ming Dynasty until today. And they have the white, uh, the very, um, very, very well known, the blue and white porcelain Qing Hua Zi. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about how the uh, translation of Qing Hua in Chinese means uh, Celadon flower, which also is, is kind of not very, uh, uh, I guess, accurate description of what it is. Um, but how it's the commonly referred to as the blue and white porcelain, which does not really speak to the, uh, I guess, the, the, the depth of the technique that has to be involved in making it because it is not with a blue paint. Instead, it was with a black paint, um, but it gets burned at very high temperature and um, the high heat basically turns the black paint into blue. And during this uh, basically very violent process of the high fire, it's very easy to ruin the paint. So um, it, there's special techniques have to be used for uh, the, the painting, the pattern, especially if it's really fine, to actually stay and come out as desired. And whenever you have very complicated shapes due to the contraction of the um, uh, the burning, um, it also can, can ruin what your uh, initial vision is. So it's basically something that uh, takes a lot of experience to do. Uh, nowadays, you know, if it's just the blue and white color kind of porcelain, it's usually not considered the same as the uh, Qinghua that we talk about, which also translates to blue and white porcelain. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 and this I think is a very complicated, yeah, fascinating history for porcelain processing, but besides porcelain processing uh, for tea utensils and also the fine clay teapot is also adopted by Chinese people uh, or before uh, being um, noticed by the tea experts for the tea drinking uh, pot uh, called Jing, uh, Yixing the, uh, in Yixing city in Jiangsu province in the southeast part of China. Who, where, they're, where they have the very special mine, uh, a clay mine uh, that, was can, that, that can be used for the teapot manufacturing. It's called zisha in, Ch in Chinese, uh, also known as red clay or purple clay. And this clay is quite different from other pottery clay. It's very, uh, very fine and very tender and gentle and also easy to shape into different types and the product, the teapot, is very uh, non-glazed but still very smooth and and, and very good for the tea for tea uh, infusing uh, for the uh, very multi multi um, how's it for their special structure that can make the tea liqueur taste uh, without the this um, this is this steeping odor uh, that will probably probably cause by the um, the other tea, uh, the porcelain teapots. Um, but the teapots from Ming Dynasty is actually not that small. It's quite big compared to what we have now. Um, they used to be the, the teapot um, bigger, uh, same size as the 400 to 500 cc or even bigger, 800 to 1000. And, uh, um, and, and also the teacups they adopt in Ming Dynasty started to uh, from, from changing from the black uh, glazed porcelain to white glazed porcelain or the white uh, gray, uh, blue white porcelain because the, in those in Ming Dynasty the changing for the tea product and uh, leading to a changing of the way people enjoy it uh, without uh, the white foam and the tea leaves and tea liqueur's own color with green or brown or um, 
or or, or the uh, the yellow, yellowish green color will be more will be better observed in the uh, with the white glazed cup. So that's that, and that is why the Jin De Zhen, uh, the porcelain from Jin De Zhen, is better for tea drinking, and it's and also this cultural uh, preference is being inherited by Chinese people for nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because the very high density of the uh, porcelain and also it is glaze. Um, I often say that uh, at some point people have to decide if you're a tea person or a teapot person, right? Uh, so all in all, uh, porcelain interferes the least with the tea drinking experience. But of course, it does not provide the same experience for you if you want to uh, have this journey where you season your teapot and uh, you know have it passed down through the years or even to um, you know your your next generation and things like that. But so it's two different things uh, that we're talking about. And another thing I want to mention because I see that somebody uh, has mentioned that uh, I think there's just like a lot of uh, uh, fundamental misunderstandings uh, and that's the reason why we're doing this series because I feel like there are a lot of uh, uh, misinformation in the West about tea but we want to keep it uh, you know stay in the scope that we have uh, for these lectures which just talk about the tea drinking um, instead of you know talking about the definitions of tea and then teaware and stuff like that. Uh, I do want to mention one thing though is that zisha does not equal uh, yixing teapot, right? So there are many different areas you can find zisha, um, but there are many different qualities of zisha. Um, yixing is merely the location where we think that this, the best zisha teapot comes from. Um, so without knowing exactly where the teapot come from, uh, it should not be called a yixing teapot, it should be called a zisha teapot, unless you're very sure it comes from yixing, yeah, which majority of them, I don't think they are, <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, this is a complication of, of explanation for the teapot and resources for that. And, uh, but it's, I don't think that that's a, the most important uh, improvement that people have, the tea expert or tea drinker actually give out in the main density is uh, for the tea utensils, but also uh, the in the first time of history, people start to notice about environment and the, uh, the whereabouts they're drinking their tea within. For in main density, the tea experts and tea, or the tea lovers uh, who also, who mostly, uh, who oftenly are also the uh, very uh, important or very um, scholar, intelligent scholars in Chinese, uh, with uh, trained with a lot of ch traditional Chinese cultures and uh, learnings. That they start to notice that drinking tea in different environments give you a total different enjoyment uh, or uh, yeah, the, the, and the joy of tea drinking. Uh, first, kind of like uh, they they will drinking the tea in the natural sceneries, uh, sceneries including. Uh, for this picture is called, was uh, painted by one Chinese very famous officer and I mean in the late Ming yeah in the late Ming dynasty and uh, his work uh, calligraphy work uh, calligraphy works and the painting works are also very famous the, he, and his Wen Zhengming in his work he get, he recorded one uh, experience for the spring uh, tour for the, to the Huishan uh, in, also in Jiangsu province and uh, to to enjoy himself with the, to enjoy the uh, painter and his friends for the view of the beautiful view of scenery, natural scenery, and also to taste the water, the spring water, very famous spring water, the second best water considered by them, uh, <laughs> the second best. <laughs> Exactly the same, very interesting Chinese, yeah. very sad Chinese ancient uh, traditional uh, music. Um, yeah. by, Ar -Hu. by uh, Ar -Hu, yeah. And it's, uh, it's supposed to be a very uh, calm and uh, scenic music, but because it, it was made famous by this very, very tragic musician uh, <laughs> that lived at the uh, beginning of 20th century. Uh, therefore, nowadays people usually recognize it as a sad music, but it's it's a it's supposed to be scenic music. Yeah, but it's, it's actually a very very calm music and very um a comforting music. And uh, yet also the scenery in Huishan is also very comforting. Uh, I have I used to set foot um, in there. Yeah, I used to visit there and it's still a very beautiful place to visit, especially with the natural scenery there, uh, the forest and the water and 
yeah, the people, <laughs> lots of people <laughs> visiting there always. And this is a place, a very, very famous site for Sing Song Dynasty. I think, yeah, Sing Tang and Song Dynasty. So in Ming Dynasty, there are lots of, of officers who works or lives nearby will, uh, will uh, invite their friends over for a spring tour in, in those areas. And also we can see in the left part of the, of the picture, there is a, servants who serve the officers and uh, making the tea for them. So this is a very, um, bis a very, um, uh, I think it's a major tea enjoying, um, enjoyment for Chinese people in Ming Dynasty. And also um, they have other uh, way of drinking, uh, have other place for drinking tea, uh, especially set for tea drinking, including the, in their study rooms. And this painting is from uh, the, also the late Ming Dynasties uh, painter in the uh, painted in the early 16th century uh, in, in late 16th century is called uh, the painter is called his name Tang Bohu and Shi Ming to his drinking tea or tea drinking uh, picture uh, tea, tea drinking uh, painting for the for, for, for waiting for his own friend who was lit by the uh, lit by the uh, younger servants and also a very very unique innovation for tea drinking environment in Ming Dynasty and only in Ming Dynasty is that uh, some scholars started to build their own tea pavilion. Uh, their tea, the, pa the tea pavilion in, or in Chinese cha liao, cha ting, is only being, uh, no, being recorded and being built uh, by Chinese people in Ming Dynasty because after Qing Dynasty we'll talk about later, uh, the, there's a, a very um, significant changing for the tea culture from elite to the ordinary people to the all class people all, all, all classes and so the in tea pavilion chinese people will, the scholars will have their guests in, uh, in invited into the tea uh, yeah tea for, for the in, in their own little houses or the pavilion with uh, with a great scenery, scenery view uh, in, can be seen from the tea, uh, from the pavilion and have their own servants who is try, who is serving the tea for them. So in Ming Dynasty, there are lots of um, very um, important changes, including from the tea product involving from the tea cake to the loose tea and the refined loose tea, and then also the drinking um, environments being noticed by the other by the tea drinkers and making their own tea drinking houses or little houses or flats can be only used for tea and that's called cha liao and the but compared to the very uh, to, to many innovates and the tea drinking methods for boiling uh, is actually brewing stuff is very easy and quite close or, or basically exactly same the way we do now um, raise the utensil first and place the tea, tea pots adding the water with a about temperature uh, temperature uh, of 90 Celsius degree and pour the liqueur into the cups and then share and drink and then reboot so it's quite similar to nowadays and uh, very unfortunately I searched for the uh, internet video clips uh, there are a lot of lots of inaccurate interpretation so i uh choose from my own one of my own teaching material uh for the demonstration of tea drinking methods uh quite uh, basically same steps compared to the ming dynasty uh pao cha style but some utensils are of course very modernized <laughs> So giving out the gestures and showing it. So we can see uh, the, the teapot I use is actually the modern teapot. So basically adjusting the teaware to where um, so, um, kind of like a, everything has a place kind of concept. Uh, this is uh, the classroom of Angry, uh, Agriculture University uh, for the tea culture and brewing classroom. Uh, 
查到茶盒中。茶盒将大的茶口先向前推。So show your guests the、uh, tea leaves from the tea lotus. 同时，您转上半身，在与前方宾客有目光交流的同时，将茶叶尽可能的向前推、向下放，使得对方可以很明、很清楚的看到茶叶的造型。赏茶过后，温壶。And、now、um, we're warming the、um, teapot. Because cleanliness is very important. That's why、uh, no matter sky one or the lid of the teapot, you usually do not want to put where it touches water or tea.、Uh, that part down on the tea tray. So you either put it up or you find another holder for that. 可以采取这样的温壶方式：双手拿起茶巾，茶巾飘在左手，同时伸出左手，用茶巾垫住壶的壶流下侧，然后右手握住杯柄，拇指可以的话，轻轻抵住杯盖，抵住壶盖，由外向内。So this is to warm the teapot when the teapot is kind of big and prevent you burning yourself. So you go around with the water, so you don't waste a lot of hot water. So you want to pour around the tea or around the edge of the vessel into tea? That's、uh, around the vessel, I think. Some some tea expert will、uh, will recommend to not directly pour the water onto the tea leaves, which is not very scientifically necessary, but still is believed as a gentle way to treat the tea leaves. I, I don't really think there's a big difference between those two gestures. Remember, low water, uh, sorry, uh, high water, low tea, right? Yeah. And you want to like give it enough force so the tea can, um, you see, kind of activate the tea almost. Yes.、Yeah. 盖上壶盖。此时，我们的大壶里的茶已经冲泡上了。我们需要给它一个浸润的时浸润的时间。那么，在浸润的茶汤的同时，我们需要将杯子中的水。So while the tea is brewing, we're using this time to clean the、uh, tea cups. For this,、uh, this is sequence of the steps for the raising the cup after the. Uh, making of or for infusing the tea is actually a new innovation for from a、uh, uh, made by my、uh, 
my teachers, my uh, yeah, the teachers, uh, Professor Ding and, and Professor Hua, they choose to, to have this um, changing because of the it's more scientific to make tea in this way, uh, just to prevent the way too mild tea liqueur after the whole tea, the whole tea cup rinsing and make the tea. So this is a, uh, there are a lot of the uh, reasonable changes for tea uh, stepping sequences for nowadays. We probably will discuss it for next week about the modern tea artist. We want to do uh, pour about uh, uh, seventy percent full of the um, vessel, not uh, entirely full. And this this way of the for sharing tea uh, in the in this um or what we call the the average pouring sharing methods was actually adopted by the old fashioned way of tea making uh, derived from Ming Dynasty Pao Cha style because for the one most important feature of the modern tea uh, modern Chinese tea art is that we uh, widely use the fair mark. Oh, very yeah, very yeah. This was in, invented. This cup was invented by the Taiwanese tea experts, tea artists, in the late seventeenth and in late nineteen seventies. Uh, yeah. So this is a core difference between the old China, uh, old Ming Dynasty, Ming Dynasty style, Pao Cha style, and to the modern tea Pao Cha, modern modern tea drinking style. Yeah, so sometimes you see uh, people would start in the circular motion to pour into smaller cups or uh, go back and forth when it's a longer line of cups. It's for the same purpose. So we basically have even tasting liqueur um, uh, coming out from the teapot uh, based on the logic that the uh, first drop of liqueur that comes out from the teacup, uh, teapot is different from the last drop. Um, of course, that can be resolved if you just use a fairness pitcher, which is very commonly used now. This way, you're able to uh, proportioning the tea into the different cups uh, gracefully and also allow your uh, guests to enjoy tea at different times. Yeah. So uh, this is a demonstration for the Pao Cha style uh, the, the inspired by the Ming Dynasty, but the real Pao Cha innovation inspired by the Ming Dynasty Pao Cha style is actually what we have now, obviously now as Kung Fu's tea art, tea art style, uh, in, innovated in Qing Dynasty, which is the last feudalism or the imperialism dynasty in China's, in China's history, and the very, very uh, time time era for the modernization of tea industrial in the early and late uh, in, in the 19 uh, late 19th century to the early 20th century uh, but this for, for in, Qing, in Qing dynasty the drinking methods are pretty much the same as the Bing dynasty but only without the old Dian Cha style which already disappeared in the late Ming Dynasty and the Zhu Cha style is then more mostly adopted by the minority people who live in the border areas, including Yunnan provinces, for some like La Hu Zhu or La, like, um, yeah, uh, uh, lots of minority people who yeah, live there. Yeah, Hu, yeah, Han Yi Zhu, yeah, these are different minority groups in the in Yunnan province, yeah. And, in, and people who live in the south, uh, northwest area, including the in the Mongolian provinces nowadays, um, by then, which is a Mongolian, uh, a Mongolian kingdom uh, that which is also a uh, uh, attached uh, attached country to the Qing Qing government regime, and the and also Xinjiang provinces we now know, and also Tibet. And the picture now I showed is the uh, Tibetan monk. A Buddhist monk who is making the su yu cha, the buttery milk, uh, the, but, uh, the, yeah, the buttery tea, uh, the soft buttery tea. Um, maybe not very accepted, well accepted by the normal Han people, but um, I like it a lot because it's buttery, it's soft. I think it tastes better than pure butter tea. Yeah, yeah butter tea. 
um, of course, is a, is a very good nutrition supplement in the in in, in Tibetan uh, high plate place. Uh, yeah, the high plate. Item. And the Pao Cha Fa in Qing Dynasty is, wild, uh, is, is, wide, uh, is widely adopted by the most of the Han people, uh, Chinese people, and also people uh, from European countries. They, they already have this tea drinking uh, method uh, accepted and also uh, welcoming all the Chinese, exotic Chinese teapots and tea uh, accessories. Uh, lots of things and uh, for in big, uh, back to, back in the China the very place that innovated with the Dian Cha Fa for the first time the Fujian provinces they also and the Fujian and the Guangdong provinces they also have this innovation for Kung Fu tea which is now more uh, well, more uh, well known or more famously spread in the world for as a Chinese feature of tea drinking methods as Kung Fu tea uh, Kung Fu uh, Kung Fu tea drinking style or Kung Fu Cha Kung Fu Cha, yeah, mm -hmm. with a G, but Kung Fu, so Kung Fu yeah. equals Kung Fu, uh, but not the same as the martial art Kung Fu. It's the same, no. person, but different uh, character yeah. for, for the writing, yeah. And in, in Qing Dynasty, which is, uh, which is, which is cons uh, considered as a boom of tea manufacturing uh, styles, or for processing skill improvements, a very important time of the tea history. That is when in Qing Dynasty, that uh, uh, when people started to gather up all our six uh, known uh, manufacturing process, including the black, black tea, which is um, according to local myth and legends, and uh, some uh, inherits people telling stories generation by generation that Hong Cha, a Chinese red tea or English black tea uh, is, many, is, uh, is invented or by accidents in during the time of the uh, Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty, their conflicts wars and uh, um, during the regime uh, transmission year, uh, which is uh, the mid of the 17th century and also known to the European people, uh, firstly as the Bohi tea. Bohi is actually a name of the uh, places in Fujian province, the very, very place of the Wu Yi Cha now as the Oolong tea, a very famous kind of Oolong tea, and also the region of black tea, uh, Chinese Hong Cha, Xiao Zhong Hong Cha, Lepsan So Chong. Uh, Lepsan So Chong and the Bohi, which is pronouncing very differently from the Mandarin pronunciation nowadays, but if you really know the Hokkien or Fujian uh, dialect, you will know this is definitely the translation of by sound uh, according to their own dialects. For Wu Yi in, in Fujian dialect is Bo Yi, Bo Yi, uh, and also the uh, Wu Long is O Long. And this two kind of tea, and in the last in the left part, where I show the picture of the black tea. The original ones like uh, Lepsen So Chong, and the, in the red part is the uh, Kimen black tea. This is two kind of black tea in China. Lepsen So Chong is what we call Xiao Zhong Hong Cha. Uh, normally has a loose tea leaves and uh, very light twisted tea strings. And compared to the Kung Fu Hong Cha, which is also a Kung Fu, but it's not Kung Fu because this Kung Fu. Actually, in Chinese, uh, means time consuming. For Qimen black tea, Qimen black tea, or Qimen Kung Fu black tea, or Zheng Zheng He Kung Fu black tea, Bai Ling Kung Fu black tea. Yeah, this is basically the uh, different different uh, time consuming for the tea processing. For uh, for Zheng for Lepsen So Chong for the Xiao Zhong Hong Cha. Uh, Lepsen So Chong black tea. Um, the tea processing mostly focused on the initial. Uh, or the grass processing, uh, which uh, the, the fermentation or we call oxidation and uh, the dry uh, and the drying by roasting is basically the same. This is basically all. But for Kung Fu black tea, uh, especially Qimen Kung Fu black tea, the major um, processing uh, highlights is actually uh, focused on the refinement to sifting and, uh, and blending and grading. And this is quite different. So it looks completely different. Uh, but still, they have have the same color appearance for dry tea product, is which is brown and dark, and also glazed a lot, very pleasing. And the oolong tea, uh, I think oolong tea is now uh, the, has a big uh, has the most tea 
kinds for the tea products from the uh, making uh, ma uh, from, from the center of this make uh, this processing manufacturing in Fujian province. In the north parts, they will have the Wu Yi Minbei Wulong, like Da Hong Pao, the red robe, or the Shui Xie, and or Qi Lan or other. And in the southern part of Fujian, they will have Tie Guan Yin, the Iron Buddha, or uh, Iron Guan Yin, or and also in 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 Taiwan and Taiwan area, they will have the same uh, different, different, uh, yeah, t t same difference between the roasty, uh, roasty taste of uh, Minbei oolong and to the floral and fruity taste of uh, Minnan oolong. And this kind of tea was made in the uh, mid of Qing Dynasty uh, in Yongzheng, uh, Yongzheng Huangdi, the fourth, the, yeah, the fourth emperor of the Qing Dynasty. And the white tea, uh, white tea, white tea, there are in Chinese called Bai Cha. The two characters of bai cha, the color of white and the tea of cha, is actually being found in the Chinese uh, ancient tea books very early, uh, with date back to the early Song Dynasty, which is 10th to 11th century. But this, this those kind of tea, is, uh, those kind of recording actually re related to the very uh, famous tea uh, variety in now China, anzi bai cha, uh, not not specifically anzi bai cha, but the uh, but the uh, albino. Uh, Variety of tea trees, and in this uh, this kind of the white tea will be called the actual history of anji bai cha. Anji bai cha is a newly invented tea. She's just using that as an example to talk about the history of albino tea, which is different from white. So albino tea as a white tea uh, cultivar is different. The, the, basically, not even a white tea cultivar, a, a cultivar of tea that is white versus white tea, which nowadays we use to describe the uh, category of tea that's based on how the tea is processed. That's uh, two different things. Yeah. yeah well, the, 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 which is modern. Yeah. Two, two concepts related to bai cha is one is albino tea, like including wanzi bai cha, and the other bai cha named uh, zheng he and fu ding da bai cha, or any other kind. But those tea actually, especially anzi bai cha, is manufactured as the way of green tea. So basically, it's a green tea, only using the albino uh, variety materials, uh, fresh leaves. And the, the white tea we talk about and show now on the pictures is actually the white tea of very special uh, processing way they have they only have the withering and drying and a certain when the when the tea when the tea leaves are reaching a certain point of oxidation what we call fermentation uh, with quotes and the the, tea, uh, the workers and the farmers will stop this and dry the tea leaves to completely dry so it seems to be very easy just like the way you just dry ring dry all your um, other uh, food ingredients like raisin or something, but it's actually very hard to mint, hard to get the ch accurate changing point. So, bai cha as a concept for tea processing uh, skills is very hard to get and re highly rely on experiences. Right. So, right. Uh, in late Qing Dynasty, Chinese people not fi then finally gather up all the six categories of tea, including uh, green tea, which is now still a major. Um, Biggest type, uh, biggest volume of tea process, tea manufacturing production, and also the uh, the the cha, the second innovated, and the huang cha, the black tea, uh, yellow tea, and black tea, and oolong tea, and then the white tea, uh, which is uh, concept for the tea processing uh, rather than uh, albino variety. Yeah, so the. Tea utensils that adopted by Qing, uh, Qing Dynasty uh, is quite similar to Ming Dynasty. Uh, basically, it's not changing. There, uh, there. Of course, there are still some improvements for like the teapots in Qing Dynasty is more um, being noticed or um, valued as an artistic, uh, artistic utensil in, instead of just a utensil. So in Qing Dynasty, the porcelain and the zisha teapot is very popular and adopted by different people, of course, by different um, Rate for the the value of the tea of, of the utensils itself, and the very famous one is Man Shuhu, as showed in this picture, uh, which is designed by the, by a by a, a local officer who named Chen Man uh, He is a scholar and he's a painter. He's a, a poet, a very uh, talented officer, even way too talented for and 
bureaucratic officer. <laughs> He's very, very famous people for the Zhishafu manufacturing history in Qing Dynasty. And with his innovation and design, uh, his, uh, his, his friend Yang Pengnian, who is a tea pot maker, will just cooperate with him and, you, and Chen will carve all the, his, his poems and his uh, paintings and the tea, uh, teapot maker will just uh, make the teapot for him. So with, his, with their incorporation, this is new, tea, new um, artistic teapot is made, being made and we call it Man Shenghu. And now for nowadays, it's become a style for tea, uh, teapot decoration. Uh, with carving uh, with the paintings and poems or uh, calligraphy writings and the teacups and very important changing for the teapots or uh, teacups uh, is that the teacups come smaller and smaller in Ming Dynasty with the relics we found in different places in different um, in different time of air so even some family heirlooms the teacups in Ming Dynasty basically bigger around uh, 50 uh, around 100 to 150 uh, 150 cc uh, volume, but in Qing Dynasty, especially with the popular popular, uh, especially with the popular uh, popularity for the tea uh, tea Kung Fu tea drinking style, the tea cups is smaller and white, smaller and smaller even to today. Some tea cups will be smaller too, like what we call sipping cups. Piming Bay yeah, is only yeah. 30 cc yeah. to 50 cc, very tiny. And also the teapots are smaller and smaller. But uh, uh, one unique innovation for tea utensils in Qing Dynasty is actually Gai Wan Cup, which is, which is now seen very, seen to be very popular or very common utensils for all ancient Chinese TV soap opera. Yeah, so, so, so soap operas, they will always give you the, vision that once the master said shang cha or serving the tea the there will be the servants or maids just holding up with a gai wang cup like this um, to the to the guest but actually this set of utensil only invented in Qi, mid Qing dynasty which is 300 years within so this kind of tea, uh, this kind of utensil is first recorded in a very famous chinese novel called red, the, the dream of red chamber hong lo meng uh, maybe the translation isn't correct, <laughs> but it is a red chamber, yeah. Okay, uh, so in Hong Long Meng, in the probably the 45, 40, 55 chapter is uh, um, the, 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 the new character named, uh, new character just visiting this, visiting their own garden and their, um, their family. So they were, so the master gave them, gave the guests a drink, uh, a drinking utensil called Gai Zhong which is the first time the Chinese people have this recording records about the Gai Wan cup that using for tea drink. But Gai Wan cup is called in Chinese, the trans direct translation is the, the cup with, or the ball with a lid. It's not a first appear for, a, a period for the tea uh, drinking. It's actually a, a cuisine or just eating utensils, just a, uh, yeah, just like silverwares and the, uh, the ball, porcelain ball with a, with a lid on it to uh, to keep the heat uh, to keep the temperature, especially in the ancient Chinese uh, uh, in Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, the kitchen for the rich family, which is normally usually quite far away from the family's uh, dining dining room. It's quite far, like two different houses. So the servants will use the lid to cover the cup to cup. Uh, to cover the cup or the bowl, just like the uh, the, the European uh, the dome, that the, uh, the, yeah, the, the dome, the yeah, to cover the plate, yeah, while serving the food. Quite the same, just to, to keep the heat. But then people started to to feel, to notice that the uh, the Gai Wan cup, the lid of the Gai Wan cup, can be using as a stopper for the tea for drinking, and also in a very you know like very um, dainty way of drinking, <laughs> very fancy and elegant, especially for women. So now Gai Wan cup is not is more uh, uh, well adopt, widely adopted by Chinese people for even nowadays it's very common and a popular utensil a very 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 well functional yeah so basically if you go to um, China and then you see that people either serve you soup in the Gaiwan or uh, 
uh, go to certain places where people drink tea directly out of gaiwan instead of using it as a brewing utensil, uh, it's all very common because I think the takeaway here is that gaiwan is first and foremost a bowl with a lid on it, which has many usage. And uh, to use it for tea is only one of the functions it has. Um, and also for, uh, uh, we also see that there is a uh, change of the color scheme of the teaware as well, moving from Song Dynasty where the tea is powdered and we whisk it to enjoy the white foam. So black porcelain was the dominating uh, uh, porcelain during that time versus once we have changed to loose tea where the color of the liqueur is much lighter, uh, we see that uh, white porcelain being preferred for tea drinking. Yeah. And with that, with, with the innovation of tea utensils, um, there are an, another important feature of tea culture. Uh, tea culture, um, how to say, I, will, I wouldn't say it's at like uh, in, improvements. I would like to say it's kind of like extension, but consumer. Right. Consum it's like a, yeah, it's like an explosion of, of explosion from the only being adopted by the elites or the noble family or the aristocracy to the all classes beverage. And this is very interesting, and, uh, and alongside with that, the tea house is a very special uh, commercial or business center for the normal people, for the for the just average citizen. Even the countryside, uh, even the peasants will have their own gathering up places with the tea, especially in the area in provinces like Sichuan and Yunnan, where have the tea, where has the tea uh, production and plantation area, and so. The rise of tea houses is now considered as a very uh, important figure for the Chinese uh, has, uh, citizen culture, uh, the rise of citizen culture of, of China, especially uh, the tea that step into the all places and are, are welcomed by all classes of people. And also, that, I think that's a, a kind of like a collaboration of the result for tea uh, a production booming after the Tea being uh, after Ming Dynasty to Qing Dynasty, and also the China, and the government started to uh, release all the state-owned part of China, uh, part of tea garden to um, giving giving back to the farmers, and then controlled by another way of collection economic collective economic called Cha Yin Zhidu, the ticket of tea or the bonus of tea. Uh, this, yeah. is, this is a whole new, <laughs> whole new story. Yeah, exactly <laughs> back in the days, uh, to control the tax on tea, uh, yeah. you had to kind of pre-purchase a receipt uh, mm -hmm. from the government before you can sell tea. Yeah, um, which a similar nice. system for other products still exists in China uh, kind of nowadays. Like basically it's like a pre-issued receipt. And yeah is to limit the amount of tea that can be traded um, and to make sure also all productions and tradings are accounted for. It's just, um, it's like a way to control taxation. Um, a way to control taxation and also a way control of the people's behaviors because besides tea, there are other two products being regulated very strictly by the central government, including salt and iron. Yes. Cha yeah. tea. <laughs> the, the three major regulation factors of in China, ancient Chinese history uh, of political intervention of the central governments. And uh, since the, the massive production of tea has been, um, has, um, real, has been done by the normal, by, by, by the, by the tea merchants, and there are so many multi-purpose entertainment spaces combined with the tea. For most famous, for, for most famous like in, in the Peking Opera or just general opera, uh, opera uh, with the stage. Opera, I think it's a big tea house. Some of the tea houses are very small. They can only yeah. have like a one-man performance, right? Like a yeah, like like houses. And yeah. also, and uh, besides that, th this is a kind of like more positive cultural forms. And there are other, very negative ones, including prostitution in the tea houses. And this is what's called in Chinese, like, hun pu shi cha kuan, means like me tea, which is related to the prostitution, which is not very bad, but not very good. And uh, basically illegal now. And uh, another form is very, uh, is basically a national scar for Chinese people. 
uh, nowadays, because uh, in the late Qing Dynasty, we all know what happened after the English people giving uh, trading the uh, trading opium with the tea, and also the opium war. And but then the the whole society was just filled with the mist or uh, yeah the mist of of, of how say. Uh, indulgence for the opium using. So the opium, uh, the the way uh, people who see the man, the man who is using the opium is basically the open and as I said, how to say, being permitted silently uh, to and all together with the tea drinking. So someone is drinking tea and they're talking and they're social, social, and also they're taking the opium. So um, some 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 Chinese people would not like to mention this kind of the history, this period of history, because it's so full of scars and pains. And also, in, but I think it's a very interesting or very important way for everyone to understand why Chinese people hate the drugs so much. Because yeah. that just gives a lot of things to think. Yeah. And if we, to, we were to view it um, together with the history of the tea, um, and especially in conjunction to see how tea becomes entertainment houses, um, and also what does um, you know opium represents. You know that you know tea is very much uh, associated with leisure, with enjoyment, uh, which is very different from um, once upon a time where tea is the leading uh, narrative for something about finding your you know pure inner self using tea to. Uh, represent how uh, unworldly you are and, and these kind of narrative. It has uh, basically in Qing Dynasty, um, you know, obviously we see that the, in a way, price drop and um, it goes from, you know, the elite society to all classes, but also it becomes a, uh, uh, an element of uh, almost hedonism. So that's, that's the, um, you know, the, uh, another way to look at how uh, a tea and opium can basically exist together and became actually really popular in uh, late Qing Dynasty. Yeah. Oh, well, what happens, happens. <laughs> it's, a, it's just the important thing. We learn something from it. Okay. And uh, I listed the, the brew steps of Kung Fu's tea style in here uh, because it's, in Qing Dynasty, the major tea uh, pao cha style is basically the same from the Ming Dynasty, using the teapots or directly brew it into the big cups, like what we call cha o. It's okay. It's basically the same as what we do now, uh, as we do for nowadays. And the Kung Fu style, Kung Fu tea style may seem to be a little, a little strange or um, uh, uh, different for, uh, for normal people. So I also get a video clip for this and we can see the different stages of drink, tea drinking, uh, different steps for tea brewing. Uh, rinse the teapots, our gaiwa cups, and place the tea inside the teapot, and then um, make the tea, and then rinse the cups, uh, pour the liqueur into the cups, and rebreeze, or rebrews. And um, so, let's see this. <laughs>
外部位，双手拿起茶盒。如果比较紧急的时候，可以把茶叶轻轻摇晃，给它散开。后手捧茶盒，依次给宾客献上茶干茶。The vessels now. Yeah. The vessels, I think, is a This is water kettle, actually. Zisha water kettle and then to the teapot. Is that a little uh, charcoal burner? Yeah. But you didn't have charcoal in there, right? <laughs> it was just to no, the. We have the ethos. <laughs> So this is a probably the more uh, familiar for the for for for, the, for American people to see as a Chinese style tea because of small cups, they're tiny small cups and tiny small teapot. Yeah, so it's a, a widening vessel for the teapot. Yeah, tea and water ratio for the Gong Fu tea is normally 1 to 22. Yeah, that's like that. about how um, if the tea is busy, you want to pour the tea leaves <coughs> back where the handle is. And if the tea is uh, more wholesome, you can pour it more towards the spout. This is to prevent um, the uh, blocking of the spout. And if he, she's now, uh, I guess you can call it rinsing the tea, but really try to moist the tea. Yeah. And it's important to dump that uh, brew very quickly because we're just waking up the tea leaves and you do not want to um, <coughs> any portion of the speed is Sorry. It's not the COVID, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, I've been struggling uh, yeah, with some illness lately. So we're very thankful for, for you to do this. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah. So we're getting rid of the foam that comes at the um, uh, top and you want to also uh, pour the hot water around the pot as well. Um, not only is to even out the temperature, it, uh, I mean, if you um, uh, ever use a teapot, you will also feel like the, it actually push out the, the air bubble and it'll make this, uh, the pour very smoothly, especially if the teapot was, uh, you know, made uh, less desirably, it actually helps to solve some of the uh, problems that actually exist with the teapot. So this is a traditional uh, gesture of, of rinsing the cups. To turn it and it's called Shifu Gu Xiu Chou. Yeah. 
this tradition come from a time where a lot of these vessels don't really get uh, you know washed by the sink like we do nowadays or even with the dishwasher so this is really to show your guests that I'm being very hygienic hygienic I'm washing all this in front of you uh, which if you have been to some of the rural part of China where people still very much uh, you know everybody share teacups and stuff you will appreciate this steps, these steps but pragmatically if you do it at home you know you know you already wash your uh, teaware or like for example if you come to tea drop we wash the teaware really really well um, you know then these doesn't really serve any pragmatic purposes it's just kind of for show yeah. you know when I was uh, in my college year I go, I go back to Xi'an City which is a uh, center city of northwest China and the people who is not them familiar it's not very familiar as now they do to the Kung Fu tea style and I display and demonstrate this from in front of my families and my relatives and also my mom, my parents friends the old generation people they just feel like such a waste of hot water <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. And in those, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the original, that we'll talk, we'll elaborate on this more when we talk about contemporary brewing styles. Um, so, but just so you know that this is not, uh, not until very, very recent, this is, you know, uh, a lot of tea drinkers in other parts of China do not know this style exists. And what he, she has talked about a very important point, and I, emphasize a lot uh, on this when we talk, uh, have our brewing class, which is the concept of high water, low tea. Right? So basically whenever water hits the, the tea leaf, you want it to, to be as high as possible, but without being all splashy and uh, you know uncontrolled. But when the tea comes out, you kind of want it to be as low as possible, but obviously without like touching any teaware or dip into the teacup. Um, to see how uh, she's holding the cup. Yeah. And we'll show the aroma. Uh, you can look at the liqueur of the color and then you sip it with three sips. Remember, that's why these are called three sip cups, but it's very difficult to drink them exactly in three sips. The more you think about it, the more impossible it is. You might accidentally be able to do that. <laughs> okay, here's all the video clips and the this is the, uh, not the things I prepared for the sharing of the how the Chinese people drink tea. You mean and Qing Dynasty tea, so thank you. Uh, probably we should go to the Q&A session. <laughs> yes, thank you again, Wen Qian. Um, so now uh, I also, I'm also gonna go through uh, the chat to see if there's things that we have missed, but if you have questions, um, you can either uh, turn on the audio to, um, ask a question, which I had to figure out a way to enable that, um, or you can uh, just type it in the, uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, okay, I don't know how to do that. One second. I don't know how to unmute. 
So if you have questions for now, um, you can, um, yeah, so now if you, um, you can still mute yourself, but you can, um, sorry, I'm going to mute all, um, but now you can unmute yourself. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, uh, you can do that, or I'll check the chat section as well. Sorry, I'm like not the most technically versed. Thank you. Very. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna, uh, we're recording this and um, uh, hopefully without trouble, we're able to be able to post this on YouTube. Um, does the turtle in the Tang Dynasty tea wear have a specific symbolic significance? What is, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not going all right. Yeah, for the turtle shift, um, in Tang Dynasty, culturally, uh, turtle is a figure not just for the long living, but also for prosperous. So in Chinese, in, in Chinese saying, we have a say named uh, like the, having a very, very uh, wealthy husband. For the, specifically for the female to say this, uh, because by in Tang Dynasty the uh, main identification for the officers, especially the high officers who works for the royal family, will have this um, turtle ship, the golden turtle ship uh, batch uh, or yeah the, the buckle called the Jin Gui Dai, and firstly it was made from the fish uh, from a fish figure is called Jin Yu Dai. But yu, uh, the fish compared to the turtle, uh, the wu gui, which is uh, just like the symbol for the water. Water means the, the wealth in Chinese, in Chinese ancient cultural speaking. But the gui is much better than yu because the gui is more <clears throat> symbol for the uh, steady and prosperous. So the gui, uh, the, the gui shape, uh, the turtle shape, the, the tea canister is only kind of like the symbol for the Family for the for the for the mo for the royal family is because this tea set is actually belong to the emperor himself. So he chose so the uh, the the craftsman chose the the, the turtle show a tur turtle ship is to like the uh, blessing and the wish for the emperors who has the a long life long term life like turtle and also prosperous and wealthy life. In this tea set, I think uh, not just the tea not just the turtle ship tea, tea canister is interesting, but also the uh, this tea, the salt plate is very unique. The whole tea set, the uh, the whole set of the pattern uh, was very complicated with the the wild goose, uh, with the, the the cloud and the and Chinese called we call rui the, the all blessings and the shape and also but the tea salt plate is very different because the salt plate is, they use the pattern for the uh, Capricorn. The, like the zodiac Capricorn, Mo Jie in Chinese, this was uh, spread uh, or uh, or um, transported to Chinese culture from the north, from the Indian culture. Uh, the Mo Jie Yu, the fish of Capricorn, uh, it had four tails, a very a very uh, Buddhism myth, uh, for, uh, and a very uh, mysterious pattern. So this whole set of the tea utensils shows that in Tang Dynasty, the main uh, the mainstream aesthetic value focused on the prosperous from the uh, to uh, at the luxury and the stable. Uh, I think stableness is kind kind of like the the whole major stream of the aesthetic feature in Chinese history and culture. Yeah, so I think it's kind of related. Yeah. Um, and uh, we also have a question about how um, the uh, stone grinder for the, um, I guess, during uh, Song Dynasty, if that's very similar to the stone grinder that's being used in Japan. Um, well, one thing before we uh, um, ask Wen Tian to answer that, uh, we can take a look at the grinder in the picture for Tang Dynasty, which is on the left hand side, right, the uh, uh, shiny metal ones, and you can see that it's uh, it's more like a, a wheel that um, rolling through this trough like 
uh, thank you, uh, grinder. Uh, that's why you cannot get the tea to be very finely. That's also not, also not the aim either. I will often say, you know, the tea in Tang Dynasty is more like a bitsy tea than a powder tea. And if you take a look at the one, um, uh, the, the simpler uh, drawing on the right hand side, yeah, that's the Song Dynasty one. It looks more like a male. Um, but do we know if that male is similar to the male that's um, in that's being used in Japan for milling the uh, the matcha? I think is I think it's it's the same same thing. But the only difference is that in Japan's tea ceremony, especially matcha tea ceremony, and um, for nowadays, I don't really think the tea artist will. Uh, conclude will include the preparation of tea powder as a part of the tea ceremony, and uh, but in Dian Cha style, the mine the the, the grind, grinding and the uh, the preparation for the tea powder is a part of the uh, tea drinking style or the artistic enjoyment. So, so yeah. this is different, but I think the uh, the equipment they use is probably the same. But for for now, for for at present, the Japanese tea matcha tea I used to have is just a pre prepared by the factories, by the uh, manufacturers instead of the tea maker himself. I mean, I mean, like tea server himself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously. Um, uh, you can go back to and then um, uh, take a look at the uh, last session when we uh, dedicated to the Tao and Song Dynasty. Um, but from what I have seen on the a lot of the paintings for uh, the, the the Song Dynasty male, uh, I feel like it's a little bit taller uh, than the limited amount of the Japanese stone male. Yeah. I've seen. It seems to be a little bit flatter. But I'm, assuming the concept is the same and also we're comparing two different timelines um so they all both look to me very similar to a you know just a regular stone mail so i think the concept is basically the same and obviously this is the way how we're able to get it to be very fine powder yeah all right um and let's see Um, I'm not sure if I understand a question. If the small teapot is not called eating, what is it called? I'm not sure if I understand the the question. If you can elaborate on that. Um, oh, there was a question about. Uh, so maybe we can talk about this when we talk about contemporary uh, tea drinking, which will have a much closer relationship with the Ming and Qing dynasty than obviously the Tao and Song dynasty. But uh, so nowadays, most of the green tea drinking regions, people will brew the green tea in the open vessel and oftentimes just in a glass, right? People just sip on that. Um, but during uh, Ming dynasty, was that a thing also, or people uh, mostly do it with the teapot, like you have shown in the video? Um, there are there are some uh, some great records of saying that the Ming dance people they use chao, which is a big teacup around the volume for two hundred to three hundred cc that much. Uh, they said the chao they can they can be used as an infuser and drinking like what we do now today using the glass cup. But the records is quite uh, rarely to see. Majorly, uh, according to the Ming Dynasty tea book, um, they use the teapots more than the open cups like what we do nowadays. Yeah, uh, so both exist, but the teapots seem to be more popular. Yeah. And also, I think that that may be related to the one spiritual for Chinese tea culture that tea drinking ceremony or tea drinking activities are mostly um, social social activities. So you have to share with your friends if you have <laughs> one big cup with your friends in Chinese um, view in Chinese culture is kind of like disrespectful because you know drinking from one cup is some somehow related to the, you know, the menor, uh, the menor, uh, yeah, morality uh, behaviors or somehow. But I, I know there's a very interesting, very, very unique uh, gesture for Japanese tea ceremony, like sharing, uh, especially the, the, the thick tea, you know, to everyone will share the tea ball and turning one by one. This is a very um, 
unique and the special uh, art performance or art experiencing in Chinese culture. Uh, Chinese culture is def definitely is not Chinese culture. We have differences. So in Chinese differences, the social or the group activity related to tea would definitely give everyone a cup. So for sharing the cup, for sharing the tea liqueur, uh, of course, easier than using the tea cups. Yes. All right. Um, yes. Okay. So back to the teapot question. Um, uh, yeah. So I think there was just some confusion about um, that. Yes. Uh, somebody uh, in the audience helped to answer that question already. So Yixing is the name of the place in Sisha is that uh, basically covers a greater uh, 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 definition. That's the type of clay, which can be produced in many different places. But of course, there are different quality of the purple clay. Um, so the purple clay that comes from Yixing is considered the best kind of purple clay. Um, so basically, you can consider the Yixing teapot is only a subcategory of the Zisha teapot. But oftentimes, the overusage of the terminology Yixing teapot, where uh, it's probably just a Zisha teapot, but not from Yixing. The difference would be like champagne versus sparkling wine. So you, uh, even though, you know, whenever we have party or some kind of celebration, people might just grab a bottle of uh, sparkling wine and call it champagne, but we know that it's not champagne, champagne, right? Um, and this is very important for um, in Chinese culture, because I would say the concept of towar is not only referring to food, but referring to uh, many household items as well. We would have uh, basically uh, kind of towar for inkstone, towar for ink, right? Towar for the grinder, for the brush. Uh, of course, you know, towar for the different kind of raw clay. Um, not only for zisha, but actually the most expensive clay is kaolin, which is used in Jingdezhen to produce the um, uh, the the, the bath. <coughs> and um, yeah, so all these things, it's uh, for a Chinese person, it's almost like a pet peeve. You have to get it accurate. You can't just uh, like abuse the the terminology. Um, just like you know, for tea. There's Longjing and then there's Xihu Longjing and then there's Shifeng Longjing. They're they're not the same thing. You can't just call any Longjing a Shifu Longjing. No way. Yeah. So so that's the 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 order of importance, I guess. Yeah. All right. Do we have any? Um, are there any specific poems that appear more frequently on the teapots, or is the text just based on the whim of the potter? Um, I'm sorry. I think I stopped. Is there any poems that are more frequently found on the teapots? Or are there any poems that are more frequently found on the teapots? Or are there any poems that are more frequently found on the teapots? Or are there any poems that are more frequently found on the teapots? Or are there any poems uh, from Chen Manshong, his activity, his, his innovation and inventing of the artistic teapots of Zisha is actually that starting the, the scholars who write poems for tea drinking. And if for, for recent years, the, the modern people who want to carve some poems in, onto the teapots or tea balls or a cups, big cups or a galang cups, uh, we some, uh, I think the high, uh, the high, fre high frequency uh, choices is like the Xi Wan Cha Shi, uh, the se seven cups of tea poem, and yeah. the or just the calligraphy writing of Ning Jing Zhi Yuan, like a, <laughs> a, 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 a fitting to the feature of a cultural feature of tea drinking activity is like to uh, feel find the inner peace and feel the calm and everything Ning Jing Zhi Yuan. So then you have right, yeah. So Ning Ning Jing Zhi Yuan basically means that you know. Uh, um, it's like in the in the quiet presence, that's how you're able to kind of carry your thoughts of things afar. Um, yeah, and then so yeah, so so it kind of depends on um, I would say there are definitely even nowadays you definitely see every generation there are certain popular uh, books and phrases that people would repeatedly use on the 
pot. Uh, I think it's more rare for a potter to come up with their own poetry. It's more common to adopt existing poetry that at a time it might be very popular uh, or even phrases. Right? Um, I just saw an article the other day making fun of uh, uh, this one interior design style, how, um, you know, at, like, uh, one for one generation, everybody has to have a ma <laughs> dao in a huge calligraphy font, uh, you know, in either the office or the, the, the living room. So yeah, so there definitely be a, a generational trend of with these kind of things. Yeah. For, the, uh, for recent years, uh, the, the, um, the, how's the lovable uh, thing about tea car teapot carving, I saw most lovable ones is like the, the pig, the peggy, xiao zhu pei qi. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Or Spongebob. <laughs> I used to see that. But most like painting, Spongebob is way, way hard to carve on the purple clay. But still what you was the status of Pu'er tea today? <laughs> it's rather expensive. So what's its status? Pu'er tea. Um, so what is the status of Pu'er uh, in China right now? That is poor. It's, it's a popular tea product and a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of people, um, I think like nationwide people know, everyone knows poor tea in China now. And we, and most of, most of us will have, will give this, uh, uh, more higher price for, for, uh, for potential acceptance because it's easier for people to know or um, based on the promotion and advertisement that people know that poor tea is expensive, especially the, uh, the rare poor tea depends on the area and the, and the tea plot that the, the farmer harvest material from. And uh, regionally, I think that in Guangdong and the Yunnan province itself, and also Beijing and Shanghai, those were uh, uh, the, the, the gathering places for the wealth and money and the fame, of course. The people will have more um, motive um, or will be more drive to have this uh, urge to buy poor tea. And for other places like in other provinces, less, um, less rich or the, uh, or the people or, or the uh, tea pro producing region uh, or provinces who can, where can produce tea itself, like Yanghui in Zhejiang, in Jiangsu, uh, I think there are um, very obvious preference for those people who, to buy their own product. Like in Anhui, people like to, uh, to buy the Huangshan Maofeng, Ximen Hong Cha. And of course, lots of people who don't really know how to drink tea or don't ha really have the habit of drinking tea will prefer the famous ones, including uh, mostly the poor tea. So I think that's this uh, national drink, and it's, uh, everyone knows it's expensive, and, and someone will pay the, pay, pay the bill very uh, willingly. But someone will just choose to have their own uh, preference uh, based on their own experiences and uh, choices. Yeah. yeah, and then it's important to know that uh, poor popularity is very, very recent. So you mm -hmm. also see there's a huge pushback from traditional tea drinkers on poor as well. And a lot of them exist in uh, the area that Wenqian mentioned earlier, that mm -hmm. the traditional tea producing regions such as Anhui province or Zhejiang province. And even though there are selected poors that are expensive, majority of the poor are actually not expensive at all. It's actually, I would say all in all in comparison to most Chinese teas, it's actually on the cheaper side. So this is where I see a lot of views uh, of misinformation comes in in the Western market. Uh, poor, it's it's just it's not it's inaccurate to assume that either poor is the most popular tea or it's the best tea or it's the most expensive tea. It's the wrong assumption, um, and it's actually a uh, majority of poor are actually really really cheap in China, um, mm -hmm. and I see uh, there's like a huge. Uh, profit that people would make from these very expensive, uh, sort of from these very cheap pours. Um, but instead, a lot of the traditional teas, um, like the teas that Wen Tian mentioned that was producing Anhui, uh, they are, uh, they actually have a really high transparency in the price and also have uh, been, I would say on average, on average, they are more expensive uh, than a lot of mass produced 
uh, Poor's. Uh, I would highly recommend to get to know more about Poor. I would highly recommend a different class that we have. Uh, we did with Professor Zhou Hongjie from uh, Yunnan uh, Agricultural University um, at the beginning of the month. So you can uh, access that video uh, through a link on our website under. Uh, I, I think it's under learn, either under learn or under classes. Yeah. Is it possible for you to make all of these PowerPoints available along with the recordings, especially from that poor class too? Uh, we'll see, but we'll, we'll definitely, I mean, if the recording is successful, we'll definitely post the recording. Yeah. I would like PowerPoint, honestly, because the PowerPoint that the professor who discussed uh, poor had a lot of information. That right. would be really nice to have as a reference. Okay, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have to figure things out for that one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh. All right. Um, uh, are there any website or books, especially in Chinese, that describe the paintings and art that originally shows these periods of tea culture throughout the dynasties uh, to use a specific references to specific time periods? Hmm, life sets. Um, you know, I would say, yeah, probably more research papers around that. Um, yeah. Uh, What's the website for 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 Zhuang? Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to access overseas. Yeah. So there are these um uh you know Chinese database just like how um uh you have English database for a research paper. A lot of researchers actually uh the school of uh, uh, the tea culture school of Anhui Agricultural University is very much uh, at the forefront of producing uh, these kind of highly summarized research paper on the past paintings of tea, uh, a summary of the collection of tea books from the past. So they can act as a reference guide for you to then further, uh, you know, find the, uh, a lot of them are on internet now, you can just Google and then get the uh, the original text. And also back in the days, people write very concise. So, so a lot of these books are not very long either. Um, but to, to kind of get a, a uh, almost like a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a basically a listing of all the books and the paintings, uh, there are a lot of research papers. But for just like in the West, um, the, uh, to act as research paper, if you're out of the academic field, it can be very expensive. Uh, but if you are uh, currently associated with an educational institution or uh, with universities, you might be able to access the um, uh, yeah the Chinese database for, um, for 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 these kind of research papers. Yeah. I, I, I really it's called think a, it's a it's a C N K I. That's like the the main the main Chinese. Uh, no, is that the one? English version, which is yeah, the Chinese version of the um, uh, of the research paper uh, database. All right. Do we have any more questions or? Can I have a last question about uh, the clay that was used in Qing Dynasty? Of so course. if it, if Yixing wasn't necessarily an origin, where would they mine that clay from? And what is what kind of category of clay is it? Is it like a would we say it's a Zingi or is it just generally Zisha? Uh, yeah, so so the 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 mine in Yixing actually uh, hasn't been mined for many years now already. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so it's even all come from the same mine. There's still very different qualities of the clay. Um, so you have to, yeah, it's just the overall because it is a organic process, right? It's not uh, it's not manufactured. It's out of our control. So it's really. Um, mm -hmm. I think that area has the more of the better quality clay um, that can go better with the making style because 
the quality of the clay really has to do with the techniques that you're using to actually produce the teapot. So it's in close relationship with the burning temperature and the methods and all those things as well. Uh, there are also ways that people had to do to kind of ferment the clay. Um, and this kind of process is uh, almost exclusively to the Yixing area where people, uh, after mining the clay, need to uh, let the clay get kind of withered by the, the wind for, uh, for a couple years and then to uh, soak it in water to kind of just let it be for another year or so. So it's a very oh, long just, yeah. the clay as well. But my question was had to do more with how, where did they get the clay there in Qing Dynasty? Because that's where you say that the, you know, the clay sort of uh, keep us kind of came to be popular. So I was curious basically what sort of clay they used during that dynasty. Yeah, I mean as opposed to currently. It is. So if it's the Yixing clay, then it comes from the Yixing area. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not the Yixing clay, then it comes from uh, other elsewhere. So usually people would um, so ch for a Chinese person we we'll usually would specify we wouldn't just call it uh, a Yixing teapot without knowing that it actually comes from Yixing. Um, the term was, will not be used, that's why the Chinese will always call it Sisha. Um, yeah. But my question is about yeah. Qing Dynasty specifically, and you keep on telling me, you know, generally what's going on currently, as of, or uh, within the recent past. Okay, uh, if, I, if I understand correctly, uh, Yixing, Sisha, or Sisha, uh, the material for the, the fine clay that, that made for teapot is definitely from origin from Yixing, the place. I'm not asking you about origin, I'm asking you how, what clay they used during Qing Dynasty. It's the same clay that they uh, from Yixing. Okay, Yixing. thank you. Already, yeah. All right. Um, do we have any more questions? Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. Um, I know it's a, you know, very long session again, so I really appreciate for you for, you know, holding out uh, with us for this long. And, uh, and thank you, Wenqian, so much for mm -hmm. doing this with us. And um, next one is coming up in a week's time. So next Sunday, 8 p.m. Uh, again, we had a little mess up with the link. So please make sure you re register for the new link. I'm very sorry about that. Um, and next time we're gonna talk about the contemporary ways, the Chinese drink tea, uh, which the emphasis will be a lot be on the, uh, you know, the different styles are separated by geographic factors instead of uh, a timeline factor. All right. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much.